NFL players force themselves into expectations through performance, high or low draft status, or high and low contractual salaries. Heading into 2018, Patrick Mahomes was supposed to lead the Kansas City Chiefs to maybe a 9-7 or 10-6 record and throw for 25-30 to 30 touchdowns and go from there. In hindsight, we know that he threw for 5,000 yards and 50 touchdowns, and as you could say, the rest is history. Patrick was entering a pivotal point in his career as a former first-round pick because it was put-up or shut-up time for him, and the Chiefs at that point in time had traded Alex Smith to the Washington football team, then a different name now the Washington football team. And there are going to be players in 2021 that are entering pivotal years of their careers, and how they perform this season will determine their future with the team they are currently on, and ultimately the role they have in the NFL. And this is not limited to quarterbacks to be 100% clear, but before we get started, please like the video and subscribe to the channel as each only take a second to do and it would be very much appreciated. Now let's begin. And we're going to start today's video with Browns quarterback Baker Mayfield. In three NFL seasons, Baker has had some very high highs and some very low lows. In 2019, the Browns acquired Odell Beckham and he was coming off of a 27 passing touchdown rookie season, Baker that is, and with the addition of a receiver who will always draw attention, well, they were expected to perform huge and be a legitimate AFC contender. Ultimately, Freddie Kitchens was their head coach and he wasn't a great coach and the Browns ended up going 6-10, Baker had a sophomore slump and threw nearly as many interceptions as he did touchdowns, finishing with a 22-21 to TD to INT ratio. He had a bad second year, and it wasn't exactly swept under the rug, but it wasn't made a huge, huge deal in the national media, because Jameis had a 30-30 season and led the league in interceptions while another team in the Browns division, the Ravens, were the talk of the NFL and Lamar Jackson won an MVP. So Baker entering 2020 had a lot to prove and played well all things considering, but as of now, there are still some questions like can he play with Odell on the field, and is Odell a Brown at the start of the 2021 season? And this isn't me asking these questions to try and stir something up or anything like that. These are legitimate questions because taking a look at the numbers from this past year before Odell tore his ACL. In the six games before that, Baker had 10 touchdowns to 6 interceptions and was on pace for a 27 and 16 this year, which isn't great numbers. However, he finished the year with a 16 to 2 TD to INT ratio, which would have had him at 26 to 3 for a full 16 game season. Now, this is quite the difference, and the fact of the matter is Baker has not been a good quarterback when Odell is on the field. Now, I'm not saying Odell is the problem, but what I am saying is if he comes back, can they coexist? And if he is healthy this year, which we obviously hope he is, this will prove to be a very pivotal year for Baker. Now, I love what Kevin Stefanski did in his first year as the coach of the Browns, as it was clear everyone bought in by season's end and they won a playoff game beating the division rival Steelers. But can Baker step up in a contract year and for the first time in his NFL career, throw for 30 touchdown passes or will he again throw for less than 30? And to be clear, I'm not saying he has to do this or do that, but what I am saying is he will want a contract extension and will want top dollar as all quarterbacks do. And the Browns, understandably, wouldn't want to pay him $35 million a year to throw 25 touchdowns and 6 interceptions. Again, not that that's bad, but it is not worth that top dollar money. And that's a large reason, though not the only reason, why Baker is entering an extremely pivotal year of his career. Next is Nick Bosa of the 49ers, and this is for a few reasons. Nick had a good rookie year, as did most of the 49ers roster in 2019. They made it to the Super Bowl and came within a few minutes of becoming champions. They cruised to the Super Bowl as they beat the Vikings and the Packers in the playoffs, each by 17 points, and it wasn't really much of a question as to who the best team in the NFC was in 2019. But in the offseason, we saw the business side of the NFL when the 49ers sent defensive lineman DeForest Buckner to Indy in exchange for a first-round pick. They then drafted his replacement in Javon Kinlaw, and Kinlaw was consistently compared to him throughout the draft process. As for Nick Bosa in all of this, he played just two games in 2020 before tearing his ACL that prematurely ended his season. So why is this a pivotal year for Nick Bosa's career, you may ask, which is a valid question by the way. This is a pivotal year because he needs to be the guy on that defensive line and prove that he can be the defensive cornerstone without Buckner on the team. Now am I saying he's an average player and Defoe made him in 2019? No, I am absolutely not saying that, but what I am saying is Nick had a good rookie year, and with tearing an ACL so early in his second season without his all-world teammate in Buckner next to him, he needs to prove he is the guy in San Francisco and will be there for the next 10 years. And with the way NFL contracts work and with first-round picks, teams can work on extensions after their third NFL season. We saw that last year when the Chiefs gave Patrick Mahomes a legendary extension, and if Nick Bosa has a great third season, which is very possible, then the 49ers can do the same for him. Now, 
I wouldn't expect a 17 sack, 5 forced fumble year from him because that would essentially guarantee him the Defensive Player of the Year award, but Nick does need to have a solid 11 to 12 sack season and confirm he is the guy from his rookie year. Now the only thing that will prevent him from doing so is being the guy offensive lines consistently double team, which in turn makes it much, much harder to rack up the numbers. But with Nick fully healthy and him being the clear guy in the defensive line and the 49ers very much expected to take a step back towards being an elite team and an NFC contender, this is a pivotal year in Nick Bosa's young career. Next is Jalen Reger of the Eagles, and this is rather obvious as to why he's in today's video. So unfortunately for Jalen, he had a receiver drafted directly behind him have one of the best rookie seasons in NFL history for a receiver that of course being the Vikings' Justin Jefferson. The Eagles recently traded former MVP caliber quarterback in 2017, Carson Wentz to the Colts, and Jalen Hurts very easily could have been in today's video to be clear. Now I didn't want to have three quarterbacks in today's video with only one defensive player, but Jalen Hurts could have very easily been in today's video. Anyways, back to Reger. So for as much heat and as much criticism as Reger took in year one, largely not due to his fault, but rather other decision makers in the Eagles organization, his rookie year was bad, but it wasn't overwhelmingly awful on the same side of the coin. It sucks for Jalen personally that a better prospect was taken immediately after him, and that same prospect wanted to have a tremendous rookie year. An all-time rookie year, really. That genuinely does suck for Jalen, let's be honest here, and I do feel sorry for the guy, because he will always be compared to Justin Jefferson, and that's not a fair comparison for him to have. But this is a pivotal point in his career, because he can take the below average rookie year and take it personally, like the Michael Jordan meme, and have a great second year, or he can fold and become a draft bust. Is Jalen Hurts the answer in Philly is another question at this point in time, as he without a doubt is entering a year where we will soon find out if he is that guy, or if he is not that guy. And if Hurts isn't the franchise quarterback in Philly, then it will make life for Reger a lot harder to succeed, as it is no secret receivers with better quarterbacks put up bigger numbers than ones with less quality quarterbacks. I do think the Eagles end up with either Jamar Chase or Devontae Smith, whichever is available at number 6 overall, which in turn could limit Reger's production from a statistical standpoint. But this is going to be something Reger will have to overcome. And to be fair to him, his rookie season was far from ideal in any given sense, given the pandemic the world we are in now. But he had a year to adjust and the excuses are over. It is time for Reger to produce, and we will find out in the next year if he is legit or if the Eagles made a huge mistake by choosing him in the first round. And because of that, it is an extremely pivotal year in Jalen Reger's young career. And the last player we go to for today's video is Tua Tagovailoa of the Miami Dolphins. Now, Tua had an up and down rookie year with as many, if not more, downs than he had ups. I took a lot of slack about nine months ago for saying the Dolphins receivers weren't good as a unit and they may limit him in his rookie year, and while Tua himself wasn't great, neither were his teammates. It is no secret the Dolphins need help at the receiver position and will probably draft Jamar Chase at number three overall, which in turn will only help their young quarterback out. But despite the Dolphins not having good quarterback play in 2020, which shouldn't cause him as offensive to anybody, by the way, they were just a game away from the the playoffs and they expect to get there in 2021. Tua was a great quarterback prospect coming out of Alabama a year ago as he had elite touch, great accuracy, and not elite speed by any means because he wasn't Kyler Murray, but he had enough speed to get away from defensive linemen and his speed was certainly serviceable. And if Joe Burrow didn't have a legendary year in 2019, there is a good possibility Tua is a Bengal right now. So what I'm saying is, is to be patient with Tua because it takes some players longer than others to get to their full potential at the NFL level. We saw that with Josh Allen and now no one questions him or the Bills. Josh showed some improvement in 2019, then took off to the moon in 2020, and while I don't expect Tua to have 46 touchdowns in 2022, which would be his third season, I do expect him to steadily improve, and that has to start with the Dolphins giving him viable weapons to work with. But Tua himself has to perform better this year than he did last. There were several times where Ryan Fitzpatrick would come in for him, and that's obviously not encouraging for Dolphins fans. In the last nine games Tua played, because I'm not including the one against the Jets where he threw just two passes, his numbers translate to a 3,200 yard, 20 touchdown season, which isn't bad, but in the same sense, the Dolphins didn't draft him at number five overall to put up those numbers. And with the Dolphins being on the brink of the playoffs, with them probably selecting a receiver in the top three of the upcoming draft, we will soon 
soon know whether Tua is legit or if he is what no one wants to be called, an NFL bust. And with that being said, that's all I have for today's video. I hope you enjoyed. Personally, I think Tua will be fine to be clear, but I do want to announce there will be some changes to the channel coming up. I have not forgot about the second channel and I will start to regularly upload to that channel. I bought a face cam and will be using that to do videos on there and they will come back very, very soon. There will be an announcement regarding that, but until next time, I will see you guys soon. Have a great day. Love you guys. Deuces. Peace.